gang, and it is so good to see you guys, even though you're behind those masks, but I know you're smiling, and you're ready to worship the Lord and just to celebrate his name. So just so that you know what's ahead of us and the way we're going to be doing things for the next couple of weeks, we're going to really do a very condensed type service. It's going to be focused upon worshiping the Lord. We're going to have a time in this word, but we're going to try to cut out all, and I'm not going to say fluff because all everything we do is important, but we're going to cut out announcements. We're going to cut out all kinds of stuff. We're going to just use social media to blast that information to you. Okay. So you need to be looking on Facebook and on Instagram. So you're, because we want to get you guys here in and out, you know, having a good experience, but not prolonging any exposure longer than absolutely necessary. And just so you guys know, we are taking every precaution we can. We've been in communication with, oh, probably about 50 other churches over the past weeks and just learning their protocols and what they're doing in order to keep their congregation safe and, um, you know, cleaning the seats and cleaning the facility and just making sure that everything is just as safe and uh, as sanitary as possible. Because we want you guys to be able to come here and to relax and say, you know what, this is a safe place. But um, so today, you know, it's going to be, it's, it, you know, people will come as they feel comfortable and, you know, that's fine. Um, if people aren't ready, we're not going to get down on them. We're not going to uh, question them. We're going to encourage them. That's why we're going to have our online services uh, continuing on because everybody's in a different place. And that's okay, you know. Uh, these are uncertain times, and uh, we've never been through something like this before. So uh, we're all learning, and it, it, it's, it's good. But, you know, we're here for those that want to that need that fellowship need that time together and to worship together so we will do the best with that we can with the few that come right so why don't we go ahead and let's stand up and let's just worship the lord with all of our hearts uh who cares if the room is full or not you know what our audience is god and that's who we're worshiping not men not the people next to us we're worshiping our lord so let's give him our whole heart god bless you guys Yeah. 
when you called my name Oh, I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day
that you have given or the promise of your word Lord I stand in wonder at the sacrifice you've made with mercy beyond measure
And Father, we just want to thank you for who you are, that you are always faithful, that we can always turn to you. You're always available. And you are strong enough to deal with any difficulty. You are all powerful. And we find great comfort in that, especially in these days, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that as we open your word and we just continue to dwell on your magnificence, that our hearts would just be filled with courage and certainty and assurance. Bless your word today. Speak to each and every one of our hearts. Forgive the sins of he who speaks, for they are many. And help us to see Jesus, and only Jesus. In his name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. You can have a seat. Can a cricket understand communion? I pondered that question. One morning as we celebrated the Lord's Supper, the ushers were out distributing the elements to the congregation, and I looked down on the floor, and there beneath the seat in the front row was a little visitor. Best I can figure, he snuck in through the side door under the feet of the sleeping deacon and made his way across the room and there he sat in front of me in the sanctuary, staring. Now, the sight of a cricket stirs up many emotions within me. And none of them, quite frankly, is very spiritual. I'm not a bug lover, and if you are, I apologize. I'm not attracted to their beauty, to their strength. Typically, I'd have no other interest in that insect except to squash him. But, but, but this Sunday was a little different. I started to wonder. I started to realize how we have something in common, you and me, with, with that little cricket. And that is limited vision. Now, I hope, I hope the parallel doesn't bug you, pun intended. But I think it's fair one. See, none of us do well imagining life beyond the ceiling. See, as far as the cricket is concerned, his entire universe is this auditorium. You know, I can envision him taking his son out of the wall one night and tell him to look at the great big white expanse above them. And he wraps his little clickers around his son and says, it's a mighty sky we live under, son. But does he know, does he realize that this is just a fraction? And then there's the aspirations of the cricket, right? His highest dream is to find some little remnant crumb of communion bread. He falls asleep with visions of communion juice droppings. And, and consider the heroes of the cricket world. I mean, they idolize bugs, right? The fast one who can dash across the room full of feet. The gutsy one who has explored the, 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 the hitherlands of the lighting rafters. Or, or the courageous one who has ventured onto the high windowsills. And there's even a legend in Chris, uh, Cricket Dumb, the story of Cricket Revere, who dashed through the walls yelling, the bug man is coming, the bug man is coming. But I think perhaps the most important question is, does a bug worship? Does a bug acknowledge that there is a hand behind the building? Or does he choose to worship the building itself? Or perhaps a place in the building? 
Or does he assume that since he's never seen a builder, then there must not be a builder? But you see, that's what Paul says is exactly what the hedonist does here. The hedonist is that person, that individual who, who lives for his pleasure, who lives to satisfy his flesh. And since he's never seen the hand who made the universe, he assumes, well, there must be no life beyond the here and now. He believes that there's no truth beyond this room, no purpose beyond his own pleasure, no account to give to anyone, and he has no concern for the eternal. So like the cricket, the hedonist, refuses to acknowledge that there is a builder, and he refuses to acknowledge his creator. The hedonist, as we've seen, opts to live as if there was no creator at all. And Paul says it's not because there's a lack of convincing proof, but it's because that's how he wants to live his life. In verse 21, he said, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. So in other words, the heathenist says, who cares? I might be bad, but so what? What I do is my business. And he's more concerned about satisfying his passion than in knowing God. His God. His life is so desperate for pleasure that he has no time and no room for God. So watch the result. What happens when a society sees the world through the eyes of a cricket? Are there any consequences For a godless pursuit of pleasure? Is there a price to pay for living merely for today? Paul says there is. The second part of verse 21, he says, they became, oh, I never showed you the first one. What's going on? It helps to turn on the remote, guys. So let's read from the beginning. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. So they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Is it okay to spend our days thumbing our noses at God and living it up? Paul says, absolutely not. If you do that, your thinking becomes foolish. And your heart will grow increasingly darker and darker. See, the book of Romans is an incredibly well-organized argument. And we can break the book down as follows. Chapters 1 through 3, Paul talks about condemnation, how all men are condemned. Chapters 4 and 5, he talks about justification, how we are justified before God. Chapters 6 through 8 is about sanctification, the process of becoming holy. The last part of chapter 8, glorification, we were brought into the presence of the Lord. Chapters 9 through 11 is about election and the whole mystery there. And then chapters 12 through 16 is the application, how we're to live. But we're still in that first section, mind you, where where Paul is making the argument and he's talking about how all men are condemned, how all men are sinners and therefore separated from God. So he goes one by one through the different people groups, if you would, and he shows us in chapter 1 how the hedonist is lost. And then in the first half of chapter 2, he will show us how the moralist is also lost. 
The second part of chapter 2, how the religionist, the the legalist is lost. And lastly, chapter 3, he will end by showing how all men are lost. But, But right now his focus is on the hedonist. The the person who lives like there's no God, who's living simply for his pleasure, living for today. And we ended our study last week in verse 23, so today we're going to pick up in verse 24 and read about what happens in the life of the individual who decides to live like there is no God. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Romans chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 24. Now I apologize, we're not passing out Bibles during this corona days, Uh, so we're going to encourage everybody to bring their own Bible or pull it up on their iPhone. That works as well. Romans chapter 1, verse 24 He begins saying, therefore, and therefore always marks a transition. It's like saying, you know, as a result. And what he showed us previously is how man has rejected God's revelation. Both the revelation that is in them and the revelation that is around them. They've rejected the testimony of their consciousness of God and the evidence within nature and creation that there is a God. So therefore, God gave them over. And if you're a Bible marker, mark that phrase. God gave them over. God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity, So that their bodies would be dishonored among them, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Uh, For this reason... So it indicates kind of like now this is a second rung or a second step down. You know, this is a progression. For this reason, God gave them over, underline that phrase, to degrading passions. For their women exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural functions of the women and burned in their desires toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, this indicates a third rung down or a third step down in the depravity of man. God gave them over, mark that, to a depraved mind, to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness and wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, Allergies, don't worry. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, notice this, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So according to Romans chapter 1 here, when we dismiss God and decide to live our lives a la Frank Sinatra, my way, we lose more than stained glass windows. Notice the three chilling phrases that Paul states here. In verse 24, God gave them over to impurity. 
Verse 26, God gave them over to degrading passions. Verse 28, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And the picture of here is God did not force man to stay in his ways. But he let man go. Much like the father of the prodigal son. When the son said, give me my riches and let me go live my life. The father heartbrokenly let it happen. And so God lets man delve deeper and deeper into depravity. And each of these phases marks a step into this descent of depravity, one after another. So what happens when men reject God? When men reject the revelation around them, the revelation within them, and they choose to say, I'm going to live my life according to my standard, my way, my rules. What happens? Well, three things that we're going to look at today. We lose our standard, we lose our purpose, and we lose our worship. First of all, we lose our standard. When I was seven years old, I remember visiting my cousin in Tracy, California, and I complimented him on a model airplane that he had hanging in his room. He curtly replied, well, I stole it. He could tell that I was stunned because after looking at the expression on my face, he says, why do you think that was wrong? And I told him, yeah, I, I think it was. And he responded quite simply, well, it might be wrong for you. It's not wrong for me. See, I, I didn't hurt anyone in the process. I knew the owner. He, he's rich. I'm not. He can afford a new one. I can't. So what do you say to that kind of argument? Well, if you live life like a cricket, believing that there's nothing beyond the drop ceiling, you have little to say. If there's no ultimate good behind the world, then how do we find, define good within the world? If the majority opinion determines good and evil, what happens when the majority is wrong? What do you do when the majority of kids in a certain group say it's all right to steal, to raid, to break down windows, and to steal from department stores, and to fire pistols at one another? You see, the hedonist world... The world where the man has rejected God is a world of no moral absolutes. And, and they will say that, well, you know, well, it works fine on paper. It, it sounds great in the college philosophy class, but it doesn't work in life. Ask the Father whose wife abandoned him with his three children. And her last words were, divorce may be wrong for you, but it's okay for me. Or ask the opinion of the teenage girl, pregnant and frightened, who's told by her boyfriend, if you have the baby, it's your responsibility. Or, or ask a retiree ripped off of their pension by some huckster, who believed anything is right as long as you don't get caught. See, but a godly view of the world, on the other hand, has something to say to my childhood thief. 
Faith challenges those with, this, with cricket brains to answer to a higher standard than personal opinion. You may think it's right. Society might say that that's okay. But the God who made you says, thou shalt not steal. And he wasn't kidding. By the way, follow the godless thinking to its logical conclusion. And what do you get? What happens when a society denies the importance of right and wrong? Well, you can read on the prison wall in Poland the words, I free Germany from the stupid and degrading fallacies of conscience and morality. Who made this boast? Adolf Hitler. Were the words posted in a Nazi concentration camp? And visitors can read the claim and they can see the results. A room stuffed with thousands of pounds of women's hair, rooms filled with pictures of castrated children, and gas ovens that served as Hitler's final solution. Just as Romans 1, 28 and 29 says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to the depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness and wickedness and greed and evil, full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. Oh, come on, pastor, you're going too far. It's a stretch to, to state that what begins with a stolen model airplane is going to conclude with the Holocaust. <laughs> well, most of the time it won't. But you see, once we remove God and we remove his word, there is no standard of right and wrong. It could. Because what is there to stop it? What dike does the God-denying thinker have to stop the flood? What anchor will the secularists use to keep society from being sucked out to sea? If a society deletes God from the human equation, what sandbag will, set, will stack against the swelling tide of barbarism and hedonism? As Dostoevsky said, if God is dead, then everything is justifiable. And Paul reasons in chapter 1, verse 26, he says, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For the women exchanged the natural functions for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also men abandoned, abandoned the natural function of the women and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving their own persons the due penalty of error. He says they're going against nature, the natural function, because there's no standard. So when we reject the revelation within us, our conscience, and the revelation around us, creation, number one, we lose our standard. But that's not all. We lose our purpose. The following is a conversation that I heard taking place between a canary in a cage and the lark on the wind windowsill. Obviously, I'm making it up. The lark looked at the canary and asked, what's your purpose? And the canary said, my purpose is to eat seed. What for? So I can be strong. What for? So I can sing, said the canary. What for? asked the lark. Because when I sing, I get more seed. So you eat in order to be strong, so you can sing, so you can get seed, so you can eat. 
Yes. There's more to you than that, the lark offered. And if you follow me, I'll help you find it. But you first must leave your cage. See, it's tough to find meaning in a caged world. But that doesn't keep us from trying, does it? Look deep enough into every heart and you'll find it. A longing for meaning, a quest for purpose. As surely as a child breathes, he will someday wonder, what is the purpose of my life? So some search for a meaning in a career. My purpose is to be a dentist. It's a fine vocation, but hardly a justifiable for existence. They ought to be a human doing rather than a human being. Who they are is what they do. Consequently, they do a lot. They work many hours because if they don't work, they don't have an identity. For others, who they are is what they have. They find meaning in the new car, the new house, the new clothes. These people are great for the economy and rough on a budget because they're always seeking meaning in what they own. Still others seek meaning in who they sire. They live vicariously through their children. (laughs) Woe to these kids. You know, it's hard enough to be a youngster in this day and age without also being someone else's reason for living. So some try sports, some entertainment, some cult, some sex, you name it. They're all mirages in the desert of purpose. As verse 22 says, professing to be wise, they became fools. So let's face the truth. If we don't recognize there is a God who created us, then we're nothing more than the debris of the universe. At best, we're developed animals. At worst, we're just rearranged space dust with no purpose and no meaning. You know, in the final analysis, seculars have come only have only one answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? You know what their answer is? We don't know the meaning of life. Or as the paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould concluded, he said, we are because one odd group of fishes had a particular fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures. Because the earth never froze entirely during the ice age, because a small and tenacious species arising in Africa a quarter million years ago had managed so far to survive by hook and by crook. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. So sacrificed upon the altar of godlessness we find the purpose of man. So when man refuses to to respond to the revelation within him, his consciousness, and the revelation around him in creation, and says there is no God, he discovers then there is no purpose. In Ephesians 2.10 we read, For we are his workmanship, Create in Christ Jesus for good works which he prepared beforehand so that we could walk in him. And that word workmanship means work of art. See, with God in our world, we, we aren't just an accident or an incident. We are a gift. A divine work of art signed by God. I I once had the privilege of holding in my hand a baseball signed by the legendary Babe Ruth. My friend, and I I use that term very loosely, I just 
met him that one time. Uh, my friend spent $133,000 to acquire this baseball. And I looked at it, and you know what? There's nothing special about it. All, all the materials and workmanship was probably about four dollars. So what made it so valuable? What made it so special? The signature that was placed on it. And the same is true for me and for you. You know, if we were to reduce the human body to its basic elements, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, copper, zinc, aluminum, etc., etc., we were to reduce the body down to all the, the basic elements, you know what your body would be worth? About a buck. See, what makes us special is not our body, but the signature that God has placed on our lives, that we are his works of art. We were created in his image to do good deeds. We are significant not because of what we do, but because of whose we are. So that's why it's important. And that's what the hedonist, the person who rejects God, lives for himself. He loses his standard. He loses his sense of worship. And thirdly, he loses his worship. Did you hear the story? about the man who was searching for his keys under the street light. A friend was walking by and saw him and stopped to help him. And after a few minutes, he said, okay, exactly where did you drop your keys? And the man said, in my house. In your house? Then the, the, why are we looking over here? Oh, because the light's a lot better over here. In other words, you'll never find what you need if you don't look in the right place. If you're looking for keys, go to where you lost them. And if you're looking for truth and purpose, you got to go beyond the ceiling tiles. If you're looking for the sacred, once again, you won't find it thinking like a cricket. Verse 24, he says, therefore God gave them over to the lust of their heart, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the create, creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Let's return to the crickets for a moment. Let's assume that the crickets are quite advanced and they get engaged in philosophical discussions and questions. And one of them says, is there life beyond the white tiles above us? And some crickets believe there is. There must be a creator to this place. I mean, how else would the lights turn on? How else could the air blow through the vents? How else could music fill this room? And out of their amazement for what they see, they worship what they can't see. But there's another little group of crickets who disagree, and they begin to study. And they find that lights come on because of electricity. And the air blows because of air conditioners. And the music is a result of stereos and speakers. And they say, nah, there's no life beyond this room. We've figured out how everything works. Would we let the crickets get away with that? I hope not. 
See, just because you understand the system, that doesn't deny the presence of someone outside the system. After all, someone had to build it. And someone had to install the switch. Someone had to diagram the compressor and engineer the generator. But don't we, people that is, make that mistake? We understand how storms are formed. We mapped out the solar system. We transplant hearts. We measured the depths of the ocean and send signals to distant planets. We crickets have studied and learned how it works. And for some, the loss of mystery has lost, led to the loss of majesty. And the more we know, the less we believe. And it's strange, don't you think? See, knowledge of the working shouldn't negate the wonder. Knowledge should stir wonder. I mean, who has more reason to worship than the astronomer who's seen the billions and trillions of stars? Who has more reason to worship than the surgeon who's held a heart in his hand? Who has more reason to worship than the oceanographer who's pondered the depths of the sea? See, they know more, so they should be more amazed. But ironically, the more we know, the less we worship. We're more impressed by our discovery of the light switch than he who invented electricity. You can call it cricket brain the logic. See, rather than worship the creator, we worship the creation. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. No wonder there's no wonder. We think we figured it all out. You know, one of the most popular attraction at Disney World is the Jungle Cruise, believe it or not. People will spend 45 minutes waiting in line in the Florida heat for a chance to board a boat winding through snake-infested forests. They come for the thrills. You never know when a native will jump out of the trees or a co crocodile will peek out of the water. The waterfalls will drench you. The rainbow will inspire you. The baby elephant playing in the water will amuse you. It's quite a trip the first few times. But after four or five runs down the river, it begins to lose its zest, doesn't it? I should know. See, when my kids were little, it was one of their favorite rides, and we probably made 20 or 30 trips down that fake river. And a couple of times, I dozed off. The trail had lost its wonder. Have you ever asked yourself why people sleep on Sunday mornings, whether at home or in their pews? Now you know. They think they've seen it all. So I get excited. They think they know it all. So the holy becomes humdrum. See, rather than dashing into life like kids in an amusement park, we doze through our days like commuters on a train. And with the loss of wonder comes the loss of worship. And we begin to prioritize ourselves, our desires, our fulfillments, our needs, our godlessness, Paul says. And in godlessness, there's no standard in life, there's no purpose for this life, and there's nothing sacred about life. So what is there in life for the godless? Nothing. How does God feel about that view of life? Well, let me give you a hint. 
How would you feel if you saw your children settling for crumbs when you prepared for them a feast? And that is our prayer. In that we would find wonder all around us. In the tree. In the desert. In the sky. In the animals. And we would see your handiwork, and that would inspire us to worship. As we see the fingerprint of our Creator God all around us, and His wisdom, and His power, and His majesty. And accordingly, Lord, as we seek you, as we live for you, that we would also find purpose. We were created by you and for you. And we will never find purpose away from you. And lastly, Lord, that we would find direction. The standard of how you desire for us to live, to conduct ourselves, to lead our lives. We thank you so much that we can regather like this, that we can worship you, we can spend time in your word. We thank you, Lord. We continue to pray for our city, for our country, for our world. That you would give those in positions of power as well as in of influence to wisdom on how to deal with this crisis. And protect us. Protect us, Lord, from this disease. we would just continue to gaze up beyond the ceiling tiles to our creator God who is above all. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everything has changed. 
Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here this morning. What a beautiful gift, Lord. More than ever, Lord, we don't take anything for granted. We are so thankful for you in our lives, for our health, for our family, for our friends, for our church. Please, God, continue helping us and guiding us daily as we go on with our lives. We thank you and we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Calvario, as always, it's great to see you, brothers and sisters. What a blessing, truly, it is to, to spend this morning with you guys. We are not going to be passing the basket to respect social distancing. So if you guys uh, don't mind, make your way back to our um, offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary and, and do it that way. Um, we will be um, putting in um, some announcements online. To um, I'm not going to be talking a lot today. So just watch our Facebook and um, uh, Instagram, and we're going to be uploading some new changes on our calendar. And we would love for you guys to participate in what's coming up. Um, I know really quick that is a um, Bible study. Pastor Greg wants to start on Wednesdays. That is going to be coming up soon. It's going to be great. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you more about it. So we'll have something in the midweek. Also, um, there will be a life group in English. Yay! <laughs> and one in Spanish available for you on Tuesday nights. And so we'll be making more announcements and telling you how to participate on those as well. Okay? Thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. God bless you, and thank you, all of you, for following us. And please continue watching our Facebook and um, Instagram accounts to, to know what's coming up soon. God bless you all. Thank you.